talking about how we perceive the world as consumers. So this is the first part of the two parts in which I'm going to cover chapter three, which deals with perception as consumers. So first, let's start by acknowledging the fact that we are constantly bombarded by all sorts of stimuli as human beings, and in particular as consumers, right? What do I mean by stimuli? Well, this is a whole host of uh, physical uh, elements that are basically captured or uh, stimulate our senses, right? Uh, anything from light that bounces off objects and comes back into our eyes, and because of that we can perceive the different colors and shapes, to uh, little particles from the product or from the object that basically are captured by uh, our nose, and because of that we can smell uh, the scent of the product or of anything. It doesn't have to be a product per se, of course. Um, all your five senses, right? So these are all stimuli that uh, we are constantly impacted with during the day. And because of that, we tend to only focus our attention in some of that stimuli, not all of them, right? From a marketing perspective, this is very clear, right? And when you're watching TV or you're watching uh, whatever content you consume in your phone, right? Oftentimes there will be a pop-up ad that will just show up. And what you do is you essentially dismiss it, right? You can see it in the background, maybe in your peripheral vision, but you're not actively paying attention to the ad and because of that, you don't even know exactly what's on the ad. So you're really uh, not perceiving actively what it is that is on that ad, okay? The same phenomenon that it happens from a marketing perspective is happening all the time uh, from a consumer perspective. What do I mean by this? Well, as a human being, you're con constantly bombarded with all sorts of stimuli that you're blocking, right? A good example that I like to talk about is uh, concentrate on your socks, right? I mean, <laughs> socks is not something that you're paying attention to as you go through in the day, right? You put them on maybe first thing in the morning, and then you go about your day without really paying much attention to your socks unless you have a problem with them. Right? If they get wet, then you're bothered by them, so because of that you're paying attention. But otherwise, until I told you to think about your socks, even though your senses are sending information to your brain about your socks on a constant basis, like for example, you could feel the pressure from your socks if you actually concentrate on that feeling, uh, you're actively dismissing all that information. Right? So what I'm trying to prove with this silly and simple exercise is that there is a lot of information that you are really not paying attention to during the day. And this information takes all sorts of forms. So we're going to try to understand this process so that we as marketers can make sure that we are not being screened out all the time by the consumers that we are actually interested in interacting with. Okay? Good. So let me uh, put a slide here twice. The book puts this slide quite a bit later in the process, but I think it's useful to understand what perception is, right? So perception is gonna essentially have two aspects to them, right? Uh, on one hand, uh, you're gonna have everything that deals with sensation, right? Things that you can actually physically sense. And, and the way you sense things, obviously, is through your senses, right? You have five senses and all five of them will enable you to collect information from the external world. That's how we make up uh, what's going on around us is by using this information from your senses, right? And, you know, the type of uh, information that they actually and stimulate that they process is very, right? So the eyes, they're gonna process a uh, wavelength in the formation, right? Uh, basically light. And sounds are going to be also waves, right? They are coming into our ears. Smells are little particles that are actually uh, cut by the sensors that we have in our nostrils, right? Uh, but they are physical particles, so literally little small pieces of whatever you smell. It's what's in your nose, right? Etc., cetera, etc., cetera, right? So we have these receptors, these sensors that enable us to basically understand, more than understand, capture what's going on around you. We still haven't understood anything yet. Okay? And then after this sensation happens, then what we start doing is we start organizing this information in a way that makes it more meaningful or useful for us when we have a goal. And based on that, we start trying to make sense of the world. 
right? So the way it works, the perceptional aspect of it is after this information bounces off of us or comes to us, right, through our senses, then we get an exposure, right? Exposure is that information hitting the senses, right? Then we decide whether to pay attention to it or not. Like I told you before, there are hundreds of pieces of information that are it bounces off your senses right now. But hopefully you're only paying attention to the fact that there is curious character speaking to you about consumer behavior instead of, I don't know, maybe your roommate is listening to music or something else, right? So you are diverting or you are concentrating your attention into a particular set of stimuli that you think is useful for whatever goal you're trying to achieve at this point. And then finally, what you're going to do is you're going to interpret or organize this information that is coming through your senses in a way that enables you to achieve the goal that you actually have, right? And we're going to call that interpretation. Okay, so this is kind of like the broad perspective of what I want to cover today. And in this particular lecture, we're going to focus mostly on the first part when it comes down to sensation and how this uh, it's used by marketers uh, in everyday occasions, right? So first, sensation, like I was saying, relates to how we uh, basically gather or collect this information that is coming from your world using our senses, right? So what senses we have? We have vision, scent, sound, touch, and taste, right? And the amazing thing is that if you look at it from an informational perspective, the senses are actively collecting information 24-7, even when you're sleeping, right? And, and this is the reason why we can actually operate in the world, right? Good. And even when you're sleeping, like I said, right? So when you're sleeping, a lot of this is kind of like in uh, low resolution mode. But if something happens, if there is a loud noise, you wake up, right? Because, you know, your hearing sense has not just been totally shut off because you are sleeping, right? You're still somewhat alert, even if, you know, it may be a different level of alertness and maybe what you can make out of things might be a little bit different. So through all these senses, we are gathering this information. That's the sensations that we have from uh, around us, right? And um, maybe fun fact, uh, if you're looking at information and you try to quantify it in bits, right? Bits, zeros and ones. And um, most of the information that we actually get bombarded with is vision is images okay images and uh, because of their nature they have a lot of information they have high resolution and because of that they take quite a bit of our uh, maybe processing power if you want to think about your brain as something that processes information right and upwards of 80 percent of all information that comes to you is actually through your eyesight okay and but as marketers, we're going to basically uh, look at opportunities around all these five uh, senses, right? So let's talk about sensory marketing, which is the idea that uh, the way your products and uh, services are perceived by people are a function of the sensations that they actually feel uh, at the moment that they are either interacting with the product, using the product, or disposing the product, right? The whole range of activities that a consumer engages in uh, before, during, and after the consumption of a product, right? And like I was saying before, there are five senses. All five senses can be used for sensory marketing. Okay, some of them are a little bit more commonly used than others, but you know, if you're an innovative character, you can for sure come up with ways of leveraging all five of them. So here you have the most typical example when it comes down to the eyesight, right? The vision, which is trade dress, right? If you look at many products, especially you have here some products that you can find supermarkets across the US, right? Uh, products have a particular shape and color palette and design that is unique to them, right? So I have some examples here for you, but um, if you go to the supermarket, and you kind of, you know, blow your eyesight. You know how you can do that. If you have glasses, just take them off and that kind of works. And you just look through the aisle without really paying attention or focusing your eyesight anywhere. What you will see is that there are patterns of color, right? Like pretty much every master package is yellow. Every ketchup package is red, you know? 
So you're going to see these patterns that kind of like emerge. And this is because each product category has a certain way products are packaged historically. And people expect certain things, right? And you can go farther than that and you can uh, literally copy uh, exactly the way something else looks like. You have here three examples that I think are pretty clear, right? So you have Hence Ketchup here being uh, copied uh, for the most part in terms of their package, right? Notice it's not only the fact that the package shapes very similar, so they are both made out of glass, they have a white cap, and they have essentially the same shape, although you can argue that the Heinz is maybe a little bit more slender at the top, right? But, you know, not by much, right? But it's interesting how even the whole palette uh, of the colors and letters are very similar, right? So there's a lot of white in the labeling, and there is quite a bit of yellow, I mean yellow, sorry, green, I don't know what I'm saying, right? So you can see, if you kind of blow your eyes, they look very similar, right? There are some differences, right? There is a lady in one, and there is a tomato in the other. So, you know, small differences. But overall, you can really see how uh, one company is comping the image that is associated with the other one, which is this idea of trade dress, right? This overall design of the packaging, and the brand in a way that is unique and identifiable, right? And here you have maybe even a more blatant copyright with Dr. Pepper and Dr. Publix, <laughs> right? But notice that the colors, the bottle, I guess the cup is black versus white, right? But other than that, the shades of colors, the design overall, even the name, right, is trying to elicit the same thing. And, you know, even more blatant here, right? Uh, with the five-hour energy versus six-hour energy. And, you know, you have a guy hiking here versus a guy running in the mountains. What's the difference? Not much, right? Uh, so it's not only about color palettes and design. And it's the overall look associated with it. And, you know, uh, copying it without infringing in trademarks and trade dresses. And some companies are good at this, right? They will leverage the fact that when you think about ketchup, this is the bottle you think about, because that's maybe what you grew up with in your family. Now, if you're talking about uh, the impact of all this visual uh, marketing when it comes down to other things like fashion, for example, and then you should look at things like color forecast, right? And there's a company, there are several companies, but one of the most well-known companies for this is Pantone. So if you go to their website, you can see they have color of the year, right? So every year they'll tell you what color is hot, whatever hot means, right? I still don't know what that means. Uh, but it means that it's gonna be, they think it's gonna be fashionable. And the interesting thing is they tell you this before the year starts. So they're gonna tell you what's gonna be hot in 2021. So if you, for example, are going to make, I don't know, shoes, for example, now you know what kind of shades of color you should be shooting for because those are the ones that this company who does this for a living forecasts are gonna be in fashion or in trend for the following year, right? And, you know, you can hire their uh, company to help you uh, come up with a palette maybe of colors that it's gonna be maybe consistent with the brand image that you're trying to provide. So there are different uses that you can uh, provide when it comes down to color. Here you have, for example, if you're trying to gather uh, the information that goes in the color, you know, this is a simplistic view beyond hiring a company, like I was saying before, to help you uh, with a consulting regarding the type of color that you should use for your packaging, for example. Uh, so here you have some typical uh, meanings or associations that different colors have. And these are sort of built in, right? And um, these are derived from empirical observations. So this is by asking people maybe not directly what it is that they think so the way you do this is maybe you have two products one that is yellow and one that is i don't know brown and the product is the same except for the color and then you ask people how they feel about the product and you're going to see that you know if the color is yellow and everything was the same suddenly people you know think that you know maybe it's going to be better or it's going to be like in this case they're going to have a more optimistic view on things that if it was maybe brown or black, right? So because of that, you can use yellow for specific applications, right? Same thing with red. Actually red, if you studied this a little bit, 
you can trace this down to evolution and and apes, right? So uh, we like fruit, no surprises there, I hope. And we actually like ripe fruit. And what a lot of ripe fruit does is it changes colors. Okay. So one of the reasons uh, why we seem to be attracted to red, uh, it's because, you know, we, we like ripe fruit. So, you know, uh, red is associated with energy and, you know, in some places maybe with uh, sexual attraction, right? Because it goes beyond this. Nobody's surprised, hopefully, and that's why you put red lipstick and or reddish and why you use uh, uh, certain makeup to accentuate uh, more reddish colors because associated uh, with sexual interactions, right? Good. Uh, blue, you know, it elicits uh, trust and security, apparently. This, again, is tested indirectly. Because if you ask people how they feel about a color, they might tell you they like it or not, but they might not realize that they tend to trust more a bank that is blue than one that is maybe green. Okay, maybe because green is more associated with wealth and blue is more associated with security and trust, right? Etc. etc. You can walk through this. This is a little bit simplistic. There is a little bit more to the story because not all yellows are created equal, not all reds are created equal, etc. Okay, but this is a starting point. Okay. If you're interested in this kind of things, uh, you can really get into it um, way beyond the scope of this class. Okay, But definitely colors matter and people feel differently about things based on the color of the product. Okay. What about smell? So it's not all about the vision, even though most of the information you process from a processing perspective is actually imagery because images have high resolution and a lot of information on them. But scent still uh, a very important. Uh, it's a very important uh, um, sense. In fact, scent probably um, it happened in the evolutionary chain before vision. Although we're not sure about anything, but this is our suspicion. And scents are uh, processed by the limbic system, which is this very uh, primitive part of our brain that is here in the back. Uh, at the bottom of our brain that uh, basically deals with things like instincts and because of that is tightly uh, connected to emotions so when you smell something especially if it's a smell that you used to uh, smell for example when you were younger it tends to elicit emotions really easily in fact maybe more than visually it depends on the person right there is no rule that applies to everything but Smells are interesting because they are quickly tied to emotions. And, and you can actually use this to your advantage, right? So if you are setting up a store, for example, the smells of the store matter, right? This is something that maybe a lot of people don't put a lot of thinking, uh, a lot of thought into, right? So you can actually, uh, there are devices, there are machines that you can buy to dis disperse specific smells, right? So if you're a supermarket, right, and you have, I don't know, a bakery section, on top of baking cookies all the time because they smell delicious. If you cannot do that because maybe it's not feasible from the operations perspective, you can disperse maybe cinnamon smell or something like that. That will just uh, make it pleasant and attractive and it will actually connect to what people expect in a bakery, right? Of course, maybe cinnamon is not the best smell for other parts of the store. Maybe it's not the best for the, I don't know, for the fish and meat section, I don't know. So you'll have to think about what actually makes sense given the uh, configuration of the store. Maybe I will post a little video for you guys in Canvas that you can actually access and look at how some stores are actually leveraging these machines that enable you to change the scent of the product, change the atmospherics of the store, and because of that maybe entice people to buy uh, either a different product or more of the product or etc. okay? Uh, speaking of scent marketing, when I was in uh, Cincinnati, uh, one of the things that we used to do is uh, Cincinnati is the headquarters for Procter & Gamble, one of the largest consumer packaged goods uh, companies in the world, not just in the U.S. And one of the things we used to do is we used to help Procter & Gamble 
with a, a fragrance panel that was essentially uh, run by our PhD students and faculty. And what we used to do is we used to experiment with different scents that were given to us by PNG and see what their effects were in terms of the preferences and other associations by students of uh, mostly our undergrad program, right? And this will help PNG select what kind of scents they use for the different products like Tide, etc. Okay, products that you probably have purchased or seen in the store at least. Okay. What about sound? Same things apply to sound. And sound can be used in different ways. For example, music can be used at a store and because the different tempo is going to make people move faster or slower. So you want slightly slower music or tempo so that people will stay more in the store. On the other hand, if you're a really busy restaurant and you want people to maybe move a little bit faster so you can serve more customers, then maybe you want slightly faster up-tempo music, right? Something that is going to keep people, people moving along a little bit faster, in this case, uh, eat a little bit faster in your restaurant, right? And you can go beyond this, right? And you can use sound for branding. Uh, for example, there are certain chimes that are used by some companies. For example, famous one will be Intel, right? At the end of their commercials, then with the same jingle, right? You can find this online. I'm not going to try to sing the jingle because I'm terrible at it, right? But uh, every uh, Intel commercial ends with it. So you can just go to YouTube, type in um, Intel commercial and whatever it ends with, with this kind of like a little chime, that's their watermark. Right, that's their. Uh, from a branding perspective, that's something that is unique to them. That every time you hear, you're gonna think about Intel, right? So because of that, may actually be a useful tool to use. And you can also leverage this because certain sounds and certain um, phonemes, right, uh, have associations of, for example, shapes or strength, right? So there are certain vowels, for example, that um, convey smallness or maybe a bigger size, maybe strong, maybe smooth, right? So there are certain symbol symbolisms associated with different sounds. And you could actually leverage that to your advantage, for example, when you're thinking about uh, the name of the brand or any sounds and music associated with the brand, right? So it depends what kind of ideas are you trying to convey? Are you trying to say they are products big, small, smooth, strong, weak? Well, maybe better than weak. You want it to be smooth or soft, right? Anyway, remember it's a lot about the wording. And you can do the same thing with touch, right? First, let's talk about the endowment effect. This is something that psychologists have figured out uh, over the years, which is that people tend to value their things more than other people. Right? I have here my stapler, right? And the fact that it's mine, and if you ask me how much you think this is worth, right, being mine, I will tend to overestimate the value because it's my stapler, right? Whereas if you show me the same stapler and you tell me it's Bob's stapler, then I probably will value it about 15 or 20% less than what I will value this one. If you ask me a dollar value that I will be okay exchanging for. And that is called the endowment effect. Now, what's fascinating about the endowment effect is that people have elicited this effect in people when they don't own the product. And the way you do that is you give me the product for a little bit, like you'll have me touch it, right? And when I touch the product, maybe I hold it in my hands for 30 seconds, even though I don't own the product, I tend to value it more than if I don't get to touch it. Okay, and this effect has been proven many times in many experiments, right? So what that means is that if you can get your potential customers to get to interact with your product, there's more of a chance that they're gonna buy it because they're gonna value it more than if they don't, okay? Now, this is obviously the endowment effect is something that, you know, will make you uh, promote uh, contact with the product. And this is a downside, for example, if you're in an online environment, right? In an online environment, because you cannot touch or sense the products except visually and limited to a 2D representation, obviously. Um, 
you don't have this advantage on the endowment effect, even though, like I said, this originally started by owning, that's why it's called endowment effect. It also happens to a smaller degree when you just get to touch the product for a little bit. Okay. Haptic is this idea of the touch, right? And, and the way you design the products, touch is very important. In fact, if you are designing cars, for example, and there is a whole host of engineers that all they do all day is they deal with both ergonomics, which is how you know the car feels when you sit, you know, as it interacts with the human body, but also how things feel to the touch, right? So you will have different surfaces and the materials that you pick or choose for the different surfaces are gonna be a function of how likely are you to touch it, right? So if you go to a new car right now, you go to the dealership, let's say a normal, whatever normal means, right? Like every day, not a luxury car. Uh, what they are going to do is they're gonna put soft materials close to your hands and hard plastics at the bottom, right? So if you look at a door, for example, if you take a door of a car, the inside of a door, right? You're gonna have the handle maybe some sort of lock in there, right? Uh, and what you're going to see, if you go, you can check this with your car, for example, is that the softer materials are going to be close to your hand, where your hand will be placed, which is going to be close to the handle and the top, right around your shoulder. But if you go to the bottom of the door, maybe where you have some place to put objects, like some sort of cubby or something, if you stick your hand in there, you'll touch, all the plastics will be hard. The reason why this is done is because although you would prefer soft materials throughout because they are nice to the touch and when you interact with them, they're going to give you some positive feeling, some feeling of quality, is that, you know, you need to cut costs somewhere, right? So because of that, you're going to make the surfaces that are most likely to be touched by the consumer, make sure that they evoke the right uh, feeling of quality, like positive feeling, maybe smooth, right? Maybe warm, right? And this whole gets studied very carefully, right? This is not like, ah, oh, let's just put something in there. Right? And you can take this to even f uh, further level, like they do in Japan. Mazda, for example, talks about this idea of Kansei engineering, right? Which is try to translate the feeling into the design, right? And so what feeling are you trying to evoke, right? Are you trying to evoke luxury? Are you trying to evoke, uh, I don't know, and uh, what could you try to evoke from a, a feeling perspective? Um, I don't know, safety, right? So how do you convey that with the materials and the design of the product, in this case of a car, right? So the shape, you know, the distance, the shape of things, right? And um, everything is going to be uh, telling your story, even though you might not realize directly, is processed subconsciously by by your brain, right? So the way things feel and the way they look.